the CFC. CFC, the classic film channel, where old movies come to die. Hello, I'm Robert Mustel. This is the first episode of a new limited audio documentary podcast series about the making of one of Hollywood's greatest disasters. The Lucio Lapine produced tennis sex comedy, Fresh Balls. The outrageous tale of a man with absolute power making one of the biggest commercial and critical failures of the 80s. However, this is just one sample of the great wealth of media we have over on CFC. For instance, all next week we're going to be showing westerns you've never heard of all day, and then one random drama that you vaguely remember as the one where you see Harvey Keitel Shaft. <sighs> what was that one called again? Helen Hunt was mute. I, no, Holly Hunter was mute. <sighs> it was something about a piano. I remember that much. Harvey Keitel, his shaft, a piano. Anyway, we now commence our six-week programming of Out of Bounds, the true story of a true Hollywood true disaster, with your host, Oscar viewing writer, Daisy Goldman. Bad lieutenant, that's it. Healthy length, too. In 1982, Le Pinnacle Studios released its final major film production, the body tennis comedy Fresh Balls. Directed by French auteur Maurice Lupé and originally conceived from the autobiographical screenplay of Stephen Curtis following his life of adversity before winning at Wimbledon in 1978, originally titled On the Line. The critics were brutal, the box office takings were flaccid, and the legend of a Hollywood disaster was born. But what is myth? What is conjecture? What is legally liable allegations? And what, above all, is the truth? With never before heard archive clips. The film was a piece of shit, what do you want me to tell you? Present day interviews. I haven't seen Fresh Balls in years, but I've seen the house it bought every day. Until, of course, I burnt it down in a coke rage. And footage and audio from the time. Do you think the movie will work? Uh, how the fuck should I know? You're the director. Oh, yeah? Yeah, you'd think you'd know what you were doing. Hey, hot dog boy. Me? Yes, you, you are how you say a Yankee doodle fuck boy. I am the director. You don't speak to me like that. Now get out of my face. I, Daisy Goldman, plan to unravel the truth of Fresh Balls and really see what went on in that faded summer of 1981. And just like with any classic cult film, there's more than a fair share of monumental disasters and infamous behind the scene tales. Who was erected in infamy and who was given the sack? And who just hung around drooping away? Out of Bounds, the true story of a true Hollywood true disaster. Episode 1, Genesis, not the band. One of the film's stars, Jimmy Zidane, lent his comedy club to Le Pinnacle Features for an exclusive interview with the cast for promotion of the film. On a normal night, Dan's was one of the seediest subterranean slop bucket comedy clubs in New York. But tonight, there was one big difference. It wasn't empty. Gregory Dufont, a bartender at Zidane's, was there that night. Zidane's was the best, man. Not many people know that Zidane's had one of the first improv groups in New York City. Or that it had the first quadruple homicide in a comedy club. They never found the guy who did it either. Those were dark days. I still don't understand it myself. Why wouldn't you just come up with material before and say that? I, I mean, these guys would just freeze and start doing Reagan impressions, but none of them could do a good one, so it just sounded like five guys with issues, you know? That night at Zidane's, the plan was for all six of the film's leads to be there. 
star of stage and the small screen, Barbara Hooper. I've been in this industry so long, I have seen all sorts of women come and go. If I don't like them, they go. Natalie Wood, look what happened to her. Never liked her, and now look where she is. I mean, I didn't do it, but karma is a cruel thing. You gotta be cruel to be kind. She wears the same dress as me to Milton Burns' 1964 New Year's Eve party. I'm not surprised God smited her. And yes, by God, I do mean Robert. Multi-award winning actor Milton Hopkins. To be an actor is to know the man who's inside you. Give back and let that man come inside whenever he wants. Uh, Ian McKellen told me that once when he was pissed as a fart with Judy when they were doing Macbeth. I, I'm sure he was talking about acting. Comedy legend Billy Stone. Come on, wrap it up, guys. Billy Stone comes back to your screens in this outrageous Egyptian horror comedy, The Milk of Mummy's Kindness. Yeah, the mummy film was a low point. You can have wife number three to thank for that. I got the worst lawyers, I swear to God. Comedy, okay, guy, Jimmy Zidane. You know, life is this terrible conundrum. I mean, what is that word, conundrum? You know, such a confusing word for the concept of confusion. It should be like a simple word, like a, a simple word. I've been Jimmy Zidane. Thank you very much. I'm here all month. And Playboy model Susie Cassie. And you get to meet this summer's latest Playboy Bunny stars, including Miss Susie Cassie. You get to see me swimming. I try to stay above water, but I always seem to be going down. You're gonna wanna pick this issue up. It's so wet in here. Seriously, she doesn't even understand what she's saying. Honestly, I don't know where we found her either. On sale now. Along with the director, Maurice Lupe. Louder! I cannot understand the words you are saying. Oh, get the camera in closer. Louder! I cannot under... Who wrote this shit? It's your script, Maurice. Little American boy thinks he knows everything. Good little boy, good little boy. Little boy is fired. I'm fired? Yes, you Kentucky Fried fucker. Okay, with him gone, who wants to play the lead role? and the film's sole credited writer, Stephen Curtis. I was in three tours of Vietnam. I left Nam with multiple limbs lost and many separate and severe other physical and mental issues. Through my adversities, I still won every tennis Grand Slam tournament in the year of 1976. However, I would still say that working with Lucio Lapine was the most horrifying moment of my life. Also planned for attendance was, of course, the film's producer, Lucio Lupine. Everyone was there and was on time. Everyone apart from Lupine. Where's Lucio? I have a skin graft in two hours. And we are doing here... What are we doing here? He'll be here. He's always late. We are publicly defending this, how you say, piece of shit. I grow wary of this whole affair. No, I take it back. I've had better shits. Why doesn't everybody just calm down? It's all very expiration-inducing. It's all very anxiety-inducing. In general, it's all very inducing. Healthier, bigger, better. That took a lot less time and hurt a lot less than making this did. I mean, Zidane's was a pretty hip place, man. I mean, this was where Lindsay met Stevie. I mean, I introduced Dan Aykroyd to John Belushi. I got Donald with the Vanka, you know. I also introduced OJ to Nicole, but you take the rough with the smooth, you know. Zidane's was also one of the best cocktail lounges in New York. We had a Zidane special for Mardi Gras, which was a big hit, which was a combination of New Orleans dark rum, double cream, topped with spiced coke. So it was basically just a rum and coke with cream in it. But for the Mardi Gras, it also had some beads in there. But after the 10th choking death, we had to take it off the menu. So, uh, yeah, people uh, mainly came for the comedy. New York City music critic Alan Wheeler remembers the dance, too. CBGB's was the hottest club in New York City. Everybody played there. Blondie, talking heads. It was this hotbed melting pot of pure punk and new wave. It was the jazz of Manhattan's East Village. 
I was there the night they glassed Sting for playing something vaguely unpunk. No, we're not talking about CBGBs. We're not? What about 54? N no, we're talking about Zidane's Comedy Club. Have you ever been? Is this a trap? What? They never proved anything. I was not there that night. I didn't even know those four people. That bathroom being covered in my blood was a pure coincidence. I got my hand in there the same week. That's all it was. And the knife being in my car. I like knives. What four people? Let me tell you about the East Village. The interview was planned to be broadcast live on CBS to promote the film, followed by the first look at the film, the original trailer. However, due to budget cuts at the Pinnacle Studios, all the cameras were leased and nobody was at the bar to handle the live broadcast. Two critics, however, were there. One invited, one not. Steven Sklar, head critic for the New York Tribunal, was not invited. I would say my relationship with Lucio Lapine was a deeply personal vendetta, personally and critically. Critically, I found his films abhorrently uncinematic and a series of desperate grabs for cash. Personally, he fucked my wife. Critic for the Chicago Sunrise Sunset, Richard Fonde, was invited. Oh, I was very well known at the time as somebody very easily bribed. I mean, I'd write whatever you wanted. Lucio would give me bags of cash for a good review, or a bad review for other movies. I mean, I was the one guy who slammed The Godfather because it was up against one of Lucio's own gangster movies that month. I called The Godfather a boring ode to annoying children and the burdens of family. On the other hand, I called Lucio's Mob Guys, a movie where Jerry Lewis played Cinzano Lucky Lufeza, a beautiful elegy to the Italian-American experience. So, you know, I knew why I was there. I'd do anything for a buck. At around 5 p.m., approximately six and a half hours after the interview was due to commence, Maurice made the calm and astute executive decision to begin the interview. Let's do this fucking thing already. I've been in nicer, fought down whorehouses than this dump. They smell better, too. The interview began, but then they all realized something. Who's asking the questions? Jesus Christ. Sklar stepped up to the plate. Good afternoon. I'm film critic Stephen Sklar. I was wondering, what first drew you to the project? The money. Yeah, the money. And the money was good. Cash. I was promised a role in Lucio's next film. Cash. Put this girl back on the bus, I swear to God. She's greener than that Muppet boy. Kermit the Frog? The little boy with the guitar. It's a ukulele. Oh, one minute, Jimmy. That We got bigger things first. He's a little green boy, and he's married to the dancing pig. She sings. She is a singing pig of all people you should know. You French frog fuck. I am not offended. You don't know what the frog is, I so. know what I saw. Well, the ukulele has more of a circular bass. Jimmy, know. shut the fuck up! This little green boy, his name is Kermit the Frog. And you still think he's a boy? What film is this? It's a TV show. And, and the film. Jimmy, I swear to God! And he's not a real person, how should I know? If you want answers about a guy, ask the man with his hand up his ass. Who would have thought that Muppets and Turkish prisons had so much in common? I'll accept he looks vaguely toadish, but that's as far as I'll go. This conversation went on for nearly an hour. No other question was asked at the interview. However, it was ultimately interrupted by the arrival of Lucio Lapine. In his car. Through the front wall. It had been a rough week, and I was nervous about the film. Stress is a hell of a drug. Cocaine is also a hell of a drug. I think the car crash was a combination of the two, but mostly the stress. I mean, if you're gonna party with Neil Diamond, <laughs> get ready to party, man! Contemporary film critic Stephen Scar. The son of a bitch blew through the wall and walked away without a scratch. He is some sort of a demon or god or something, the dumb fuck personification of dumb luck. 
easily bribed contemporary film critic Richard Fonde. No, I wasn't surprised by the crash. It was the perfect ending to a shitstorm of an interview. It was a mess from start to finish. How did you write about it for your paper? Well, Lucio slipped me a 50, so I said, uh, I got it here somewhere. Yeah, I said the stars were out tonight at Zidane's for a first look at the most exciting comedy property of the year. What we saw was a passionate and invigorated crowd thrilled to be there and a surprise arrival from producer Lucio Lapine sealed the deal for what will clearly be this year's biggest hit. Look, some people do suck jobs for five bucks. I take a bribe here and there. Lucio stumbled out of his car, revealing himself to be wearing a bedazzled talent and kippah, later to be found stolen from Neil Diamond. Movie producer Lucio Lapine is in trouble with the law again. Singer Neil Diamond this morning took legal action against Lapine for theft of his car and personal belongings, as well as what is being described as irreparable damage to his LA mansion and stables. When pressed for comment, Lapine offered this statement. That jazz singer can suck his own circum... Well, I can't say that live. Who gave me this to read? Yeah, Neil's a friend. Even after the incident? That was all a joke. He was just kidding. Have you spoken to him since the incident? He's been busy. I've been busy. We saw each other in court a couple of times. I tried to get him to write a song for the film, but the idea didn't grab him. Over at the television studio, as images of Lucio drunkenly dancing around in Diamond's Kippa, Billy and Barbara smoking grass and Jimmy Zidane having a complete mental breakdown were all aired across America, the executive decision was made to cut transmission and play the trailer. The last thing people heard before the trailer commenced was a confused and genuine Maurice. Mr. Diamond, I'm a huge fan. Love on the rocks, can you please autograph this napkin? Uh, what was it like with Olivier? Welcome to Bushnet Tennis Club. The membership is private. There are worse places to have your balls bounced around. The staff are outrageous. What I wouldn't give to be that net between those two buxom ladies. Oh, such a thing. Oh. The madness is overflowing. You've made me all wet, Sonny Jim. cock a doodle do. You stink, mister. Hell, this whole place stinks of- Fresh Balls, the new raunchy tennis comedy from producer Lucio Lapine, starring Billy Stone as Fred Caddy. Sorry, Mr. Wanton. I would never dream of getting you wet. Your daughter Mindy, maybe, but only if you allow the exception to the rule. A tennis star who lays down the rules and lays anything that moves. Good evening, Mr. Caddy. You know, Mindy, you look rather fetching. Like a dog? Oh, we can have it any which way you'd like. I'm very Soviet when it comes to lovemaking. How old are you again? 30, love. <laughs> At least it's not 45. Or 15. Well, yes. Then there's star of stage and screen, Barbara Hooper as Delilah DeWanton, Mindy's mother. A woman with riches galore and a bitch for sure. This soup is cold. It's gazpacho, ma'am. It's supposed to be cold. Don't you speak crap to me. Do you have any idea how cold it's gonna be being homeless, you lazy bastard? I'll have you fired for sure. You have no idea. Get the hell out of my sight. Here, taste it for yourself. Jimmy Zidane as Samson Mailer. He's also there. He's crass with no soul and always makes a sound, and he doesn't know his ass from a hole in the ground. What I wouldn't give for a philosophical conversation around here. These buffoons of biblical proportions are forcing me to read Tolstoy, and that may be a fate worse than death, or at least worse than Dostoevsky. But he's only there for some scenes, not all. Don't worry. Then there's Susie Cassie, star of Playboy, as Mindy DeWanton. I've been waiting my whole life for a man like you. And now you've found him? I feel like a kid in a candy store, ready to lick and suck on lots of different things. How about just one thing tonight? By the way, you don't get any fudge until the third date. And for your consideration, multi-academy award winner Milton Hopkins as real-life tennis star Stephen Curtis. I fought my whole life for a game that doesn't want me. I'm not giving up. 
I'm not giving up. You hear me? Yes, I'm talking to you, president of the tennis board. This is my game, and I'm going to play it exactly how I want to. I, I just can't. I just can't beat it. <laughs> I thought I could. I got no hold on anything. But, oh, my. But, but this here racket. Oh, Mom. Teach me how to play good, Mama. Fresh balls. It's all about swinging, but not on the court. In the bedroom, in case you didn't get that. I'm gonna make sure every person in this club either knows how to serve soup or knows how to get a job elsewhere. Getting the ball over the net and your leg over your date. She's as game a dame as I've ever known. And I turned Billie Jean King. Controlling your urges and losing your grip. On reality, your racket and your rod. I'm gonna make my mother proud. That's all I can do. That's all I could ever do. Two games this one's for you, mommy. He's gonna miss. What a shund. Fresh balls, the comedy with balls aplenty. It became very clear to all at home that it was Caddyshack with tennis and an awful lot more ball puns. Critic Stephen Sklar. It was the exact same trailer. They made the same movie and just changed the sport and along the way managed to make it unwatchable and unfunny to boot. The only difference in the trailers was the little comment about Jimmy, about him not being in the whole thing. Why do you think he did that? Because he knew nobody would watch the thing. Oh great, it's Woody Allen with all the annoyances and none of the wit. What a sales pitch. Helena Neyman, British stage actress and wife of Milton Hopkins at the time Fresh Balls was filmed. And of course, a huge issue with the promotional material was that nobody on earth at the time understood what Milton was doing. He was going for his third Oscar in the middle of a titty movie. It was Carry On, but American and crass, whereas Carry On Always Above the Rest epitomized the height of British humor. Oh, come here, you naughty little minx. Oh, I say, Mr. Big Rod, you are really something to feast your eyes on. I'll give you something to feast on. Oh, I say. Harold Ryan, current critic for the Ohio Evening Press film section. To look back on fresh balls from a modern angle was to look at the absolute lowest of the low when it came to the bawdy sex comedies of the 80s. Fresh Balls also boasted of all these titillating comedies, the only one with a full-length depiction of penetrative sex. So it stands out for many reasons. Two weeks after Zidane's and the trailer drop, the film premiered. The premiere was a glitzy affair, but underneath it all was a sense of war. By the time the film was released, everybody had already begun to cover themselves. Article after article, interview after interview, each star and each member of the crew began leaking the most outrageous story that made them look vaguely all right and everybody else to be the problem. Of course, all this did was offer the mass public a wealth of horror stories from the set of what had already become the most eagerly anticipated film of the year, for better or for worse. The stories from the set at times were even the subject of major TV news. Another story from behind the scenes of next week's big release, Fresh Balls. It seems there is the distinct possibility that the film was funded by and has in turn funded in reciprocation multiple Iranian and Irish terrorist cells. Leaked documents have linked producer Lucio Lapine directly with funding the materials for the recent bombings in Azerbaijan and Uzbekistan from the terrorist organization led by Uzwar Farhadi and publicly known as Farhadi's Fellas. It's good government bullshit. It's the news media big turd sensationalist crap. I never met Farhadi in person. I never really spoke with him. At this point in the interview, I showed Lucio printouts of multiple pictures of Lucio at Farhadi's mansion compound. In his pool, with his wife, orgies, parties, golden showers, both figurative and literal. Most of it including animals and little people. <coughs> and you think that proves anything? Yes, I do. I'm a producer. A producer fields offers. He offers money. I take it. 
Half of producing is dealing with titles. Who would have watched Deliverance if it was called its original title, Guy's Trip, or Banjo Buddies? That was me. And sure, maybe I gave Fahardi a few notes about his name, but does that make me a terrorist? No. Does funding terrorist operations make me a terrorist? No. Does having deep intel on multiple terrorist organizations make me a traitor and an FBI wanted man? No. I'm a producer. Capital P, capital R. Lowercase letters following. Where'd you get those pictures anyhow? From the middle insert photos from your autobiography. I really should have looked at that thing. Son of a bitch ghostwriter. Let me look at those again anyhow. Wow. They got the whole trunk in there, huh? <laughs> oh, wow. They got that whole little guy in the elephant. What was his name again? Pipsqueak, that was it. His name was Lawrence Smith. Yeah, but Pipsqueak to his friends. You were his friend? Fuck that. Who do you think I am, Snow White? You see me whistling and shit, playing with squirrels, getting gang-banged by a bunch of dwarves? Next up on Radio 17 Programming, your weekly film rundown with Steven Sklar. So the big day comes. The release of Lucio Lapine's mega-budget, mega-disaster, Fresh Balls. Now, I am a simple critic with simple taste and such salacious gossip it doesn't often enthrall me. However, in the case of Lucio Lapine, I really couldn't root for a man's failure more. You know, I feel someday we may receive the true story of what truly went on behind the scenes of Fresh Balls. But we may just have to wait. For now, we will just have to see what the film itself is like. And whether this volley has indeed landed out of bounds. That time is now. The truth will finally be unearthed. The biggest questions of our time haunt us. Who really killed JFK? Was OJ guilty? Do the Illuminati exist? Did Jeffrey Epstein kill him? Well, no, we know that one. And what really happened behind the scenes of Fresh Balls? All equally important questions. Today, we can answer one of these, and it is the one you want to know most. So what was the genesis of this project in the first place? I saw Caddyshack, and I thought, Okay, that made money. Let's do that with tennis. Really? Is that it? More or less. To begin with, I had no issues with anybody. Well, then let's talk about Stephen Curtis' involvement. That goddamned limping Larry was the problem from the start. The very beginning, I had an issue with that bastard. He's the bastard who ruined the movie. Film critic Harold Ryan. It was rather famous around the Pinnacle Pictures that Lucio Lapine just plainly hated writers and made this opinion very publicly known. Here is an interview with Lapine from the 70s. When I buy a script, all I end up doing is changing 95% of it. So why on earth should I pay 95% of the writer's wage? That just makes sense. That's just sensical. Sensical isn't a word. <laughs> you think you're a f***ing writer, don't you? I was just saying. Uh, blah, blah, blah. See, I just said what you were saying, but better. That's my job. I shouldn't have to give you money for that. If I came over and f***ed your wife, your wife is screaming, she's moaning, she's maxing, she's having the time of her life. Do I then have to pay you? That's how I feel about writers. Answer me. Do I have to pay you money to have sex with your wife? Are you asking me that question sincerely? Yeah, maybe. What you thinking? $10 for a f job? We're on live television. Yeah, well, they showed that barbecued monk, didn't they? This ain't gonna be cursed footage. Who the f*** do you think you are? Abraham Zapruda? Lucy O'Neill, feminist film critic for the Female Gaze magazine. Basically, the Writers Guild of America put Lucio Laplin in the first ever no purchase clause in Hollywood's history. It basically meant, very simply, that Lucio could not pay for any new scripts until all his debts were paid to previous writers. And there was a lot of debts. Eventually, around the late 80s, Lucio would work this WGA clause. Through noble tactics of litigation and later bribery and threats from Farhadi's Los Angeles terrorist cells. However, during the period the clause first came into effect, Lucio had no choice but to look through the scripts he had already purchased but had not yet led to the screen. Fresh Balls fan club president Greg Riviera. 
I don't think people really understand that Fresh Balls is, is quite an experimental piece. It's it's more of an ode to American comedy in general than just a simple raunchy farce. At that time, with the clause, Lucio had the rights to the scripts and could have made Back to the Future or Nightmare on Elm Street or The Terminator, but he chose to make Fresh Balls. That's because Lapine wanted to make the next great American comedy. I had this bet with another producer. I won't say his name. Okay, Don Simpson. Who could flash the most tits in a movie? I couldn't do that with The Terminator, although Cameron did try with Hamilton a couple of times. Fresh Balls was the only answer. I made 50 bucks on that bet. How much did the film lose in total? Just close to $75 million. Well, technically 74999950 if you factor in the 50 bucks. What can I say? I'm a nickels and dimes type of guy. So Lucio had to find a script with a basis of tennis for him to almost entirely rewrite as he was known to do. He found that with On the Line, the autobiographical tale of multi-Grand Slam winning tennis champion Stephen Curtis, who overcame war trauma and multiple injuries to become one of the most heralded tennis champions of all time. And Lucio was going to turn this tale into a film that would ultimately, in its final cut, end with this exchange. Well, sir, you're all cleared up. I'll tell you one thing, Doc. Next time I handle a pair of green balls, it's gonna be on the court. The script was set, and due to previous contract negotiations from the original screenplay deal, Stephen Curtis was to be on set every day and Milton Hopkins was still to play the role of Curtis. I asked Lucio what his intentions were creatively with the project. I guess I just wanted to make a comedy in the vein of those great late career Woody Allen movies. You know, like Ants. You know, I was at the Ants rap party at Planet Hollywood with Stallone and Arnie and Sharon Stone. By the end of the night, me and Sharon were going at it. She kept saying to me, use the hook from Hook. Spank me with the sports almanac from Back to the Future Part 2. And every time she would say the full prop name and full film title. And then we were right back to the sex stories. The whole time Arnie was with this waitress in the corner and one of the gremlins, I, I think it was Gizmo, was looking at him. And the Austrian bastard kept screaming, don't look at me, don't look at me. Actually, he was a Mogwai. No, he was definitely Austrian. Over three years after that first meeting with Stephen Curtis and close to $90 million, three lawsuits, four animal harm suits, and more than a few near-death moments later, Lapine's Fresh Balls flopped out and the reviews flooded in. Fresh Balls may very well be the most inane and impractical piece of filmmaking I have ever seen. A focus on bosoms rather than talent is evident throughout, and an undercurrent of complete impracticality and flawed craft leads this disastrous to begin with idea to blossom into something far worse than even this humble critic could conceive of. And that, that was one of the positive reviews. So what really happened? Over the course of the next five episodes, we will attempt to find the truth behind the mystery of what really happened with Lucio Lapine's Fresh Balls. You have been listening to Out of Bounds, the true story of a true Hollywood, true disaster. Episode 1, Genesis, not the band. Directed and edited by Thomas Carruthers. Written by Thomas Carruthers with additional material by Rian Holmes and William Leggetter. This episode's cast. Ava Robinson as Daisy Goldman. David Whiting as Billy Stone. Freddie Farrell as Harold Ryan. Jasmine Dalton as Lucy O'Neill. Jay Reef as Milton Hopkins and Stephen Sklar. Kirsten Fraser as Helena Naiman. Olivia Fudala as Playboy advert announcer and 80s TV address. Sam Mandagomi as Richard Fonday, Greg Riviera and Alan Wheeler. Rian Holmes as Barbara Hooper, Susie Cassie, and radio announcer. Thomas Carruthers as Lucio Lapine, Jimmy Zidane, and Robert Mustel. William Adston as Stephen Curtis. William Legator as Maurice Luke Lepet. With Harry Reeves as Man Fired by Maurice. Lucy Hewitt as news host. Hannah Morrow-Ferrell as Fresh Balls trailer narrator. Matt Davis as soup server. 
Josh Bellwood as Carry On Man and Seven is TV host, Hannah Bush as Carry On Woman, Jack Webb as Doctor, and Andrew Michael Ragg as the voice of the CFC. This show has original music by Alex Reeve and Mike Whiting. Further music curation by Thomas Carruthers and Alex Reeve, acquired under a Creative Commons license. This show is produced by Rian Holmes, with artwork as well as the theme for the Classic Film Channel by William Leggetter. Certain sound effects performed by the Royal Court Theatre Vocal Effects and Foley Society. We thank you sincerely for listening and hope to tune in for the next episode, Breaking the Leg. And these pictures are all from Fahadi's mansion. Yeah, I've never seen any of those before. I would never wear that outfit. I don't know any of these people. I have never seen this mansion, never been in this mansion. I have no idea. Oh my God, that's Bashir, that crazy Iranian coke fiend. Ah, we had some good times together. Fuck. The Afghanis better not attract him down. (laughs) He still owes me 10 grand from when we crashed Branson's yacht. Wow. Wow. Uh, Sorry, sorry. Uh, these, uh, These are all fakes.